nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Live from Swansea, this is The Twilight Show with Nathan Ginn. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Swansea Twilight Show, Teachers Talk Radio. Tonight, we are talking, I predict, a riot, de-escalating and making the most of student protests. We're joined by Adele Bates, behaviour and education specialist, as the country is swept by a wave of riots and protests about toilets. What would you do if your class walked out? Live from Swansea, this is The Twilight Show with Nathan Ginn on Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. And welcome to The Twilight Show with me, Nathan Ginn, on Teachers Talk Radio. Now, tonight, we are going to be talking about um, maybe protests is the right word. Maybe some people are saying riots. Certainly, the, the newspaper headlines are screaming riots. But we're talking about behaviour that is happening en masse, more than one student at a time. And what that means for us as teachers, what we could be doing, what we should be doing, maybe... All of those things around what it means for us in the classroom. Now, as I said in the introduction there, we're joined by Adele Bates, who's a behaviour and educational specialist. I'm just going to check that she's on the line there. Adele, are you with us? Yes. Good evening. There you are, coming through loud and clear. Uh, Welcome back to Teachers Talk Radio, I should say, friend of Teachers Talk Radio. Um, uh, But for people who maybe didn't catch you when you've been on before, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Introduce yourself to the listeners. Okay, so my name's Adele Bates. I am a behaviour and education specialist, international keynote speaker and author of Miss I Don't Give a Bleep. I forgot to ask you if you're allowed to swear on your programme. Um, no, I can't remember yeah, from last no. time. I, I do again. tick the box that say there's no explicit content, so we probably shouldn't. Uh, yeah, good yeah. job. I bleeped then, isn't it? it so is, yeah. what that <laughs> what that means in reality is that I do a mixture of working in all different types of school settings. I've been a teacher now for 20 years and had to think then. And um, so what I tend to do now is a mixture of working both in alternative provisions, pupil referral units, Uh, special schools for young people with SEMH, social, emotional, mental health issues, and working in mainstream schools as well. And so, for example, last term, I did quite a big project with an SEMH school, um, teaching, mentoring, working with that school. This term, it's been more in mainstream. um, And I think, Nathan, you might have seen this as well. Since lockdowns, I have to say that the behaviour that we're seeing in mainstream is more distressing and it's more frequent um, negative behaviour. And I think that a lot of staff are feeling quite anxious and not confident um, around that, which makes complete sense because a lot of teachers had half a day's behaviour training back in their ITT. Um, And of course, some of our teaching assistants and pastoral staff have never had any training. So I do a mixture of those two things. And I also um, have been lucky enough to do some research projects abroad. Can you still hear me, Nathan? Yeah, you're coming yes. through. Okay, Sorry, fine. I will. I will try and mm-hmm, as yeah. as we go. No, just no, it's fine. My phone. My track. phone did the thing where it's kind of gone quiet with the light. So I was like, oh, am I talking to myself? Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, I've also worked in Finland and the Dominican Republic and Costa Rica, and over in those places, I was teaching, working alongside um, schools, and researching how do other countries do this: the inclusion, the behaviour, the well-being. These three key areas that for me really cross over. So that. That's, that's a mixture of what I get up to, up to this week, unsurprisingly. I've had one or two requests for interviews about behaviour. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, it is something that, you know, I want to talk about. I know you've kind of mentioned this this kind of, you know, our post-COVID world or post-lockdown world mm. really is, is is the impact, I think, of you know, of that for, for us in schools. Um, 
but you, you kind of mentioned there about sort of other countries as well, and it's not something necessarily that you know I plan for, but it is it is something that interests me when we mm. talk kind of culturally about this this attitude towards protest. And I should say, you know, putting all my cards on the table, <laughs> I am talking as someone who today has been out on strike. Yeah. So today I have, you know, effectively done the thing where the I have walked out, I've walked out for mm-hmm. the day. I've done the protest today. So yeah. that that kind of you know, I, I put my cards on the table. That is. That is part of who I am. Yeah. But that is, you know, it, it is interesting. It is somewhat semi-acceptable here in this country mm-hmm. that I would do that. I think it is swinging maybe. Yes. Uh, to, or at least certainly there are people who are pushing it to be less acceptable mm-hmm. that, that, that people would be striking or that the, the re- restrictions on striking maybe um, should be put in place. But I wonder, you know, do uh, would other countries react the same? Do other cultures react the same? Mm. It is something that I've kind of pondered about that. I don't know if, you know, just while we're talking about it there, if you, you had any thoughts on that. It's interesting. I mean, I did a bit of research before we jumped on. I always look to the Amnesty International website. They're very good at (laughs) at giving us information about where protests are happening in which countries. And I mean, this is a a personal opinion, but for me, the countries where the protesting isn't allowed, that scares me more, to be honest. Yeah. Because I think the nature of a protest, if you think about why why does anybody protest or riot and we can talk about the difference between those later if we need to but why would a group of people do that now usually it's because they're not feeling heard and usually and of course there are exceptions but usually they've been through lots of the other um methods that you might do to bring up a reason why something's not right or there's been some kind of injustice and um, so the reason we do it is because we're kind of at the end of the tether and we need to be heard so those countries that then ban it and react extremely um punitively towards protest they scare me even more because then i think well okay if those people are, are not being heard in protest then where does that energy go where does that sense of injustice go and then you do see the kind of even more extreme countries doing that um so that's that's my take on it as a, as a personal take yeah yeah you know it's, it's it's something that just kind of occurred to me i think i was reading something earlier uh, about um i think it was something about exclusions and, and and spain and as part of it there was a there was an incident where um some uh, some students had had gone on protest about an exclusion is, is how yeah. it tied in and I and I kind of thought to myself oh actually I've been thinking very UK centric you know very yeah. Anglo about mm. this and I hadn't really considered oh I wonder I guess you know I hear about things in America maybe around because, protests yeah. um, and I think we have to be aware that that's not a coincidence um, so you know, Nathan, I know you a little bit. I, I will. I'm going to put it, put my, uh, put my um, neck out there and say you're an educated man. Um, yeah. And and yet, which countries do we hear about? Mm. And I think we have to be aware that our media and the information that we receive is being filtered to us. And it it was interesting. It wasn't until I had a foreign partner, my partner's foreign, um, that I really realized just how much that we are being fed um, what we know. And I think the language thing is a key one. Like you say, you might have heard some stuff in America. Well, that that would be the obvious place because we don't have the language barrier there Mm -hmm. as much. Um, So it's it is really fascinating. And I think part of my practice is looking at other countries, because I think sometimes if we're not careful, we get told whether that's by media, whether that's by government, Department of Education, whoever it is, that this is the way to do, for example, in this sense, protesting or or student voice or or whatever it is. And it's given to us like it's the only way. And what I really learned, especially when I was in uh, Finland and the Dominican Republic, there are so many different ways to do education as a whole. And I think sometimes we feel like there isn't because we're being told there isn't. And so I think it's it can be really useful. And it's part of when I support schools, often I will bring in examples from different countries, just not to say that we can do it their way. That doesn't work either. You know, we can't just go, OK, let's just take Finland's approach to this and, and copy it because it wouldn't work. We've got a totally different context, history, social economic situation, all the rest of it. But what we can do is go, oh, hang on, there are other ways to do this, which means 
ah, what if this stuff we haven't thought about and how can we how can we use that to our benefit? Yeah, certainly. Now, I, I think for our listeners, and particularly for anyone listening back mm-hmm. to this as a podcast, you know, maybe in the future, obviously, we're talking about the current time that we're in and this week, and I'm going to read out, this is one of the more mm-hmm. shared articles that I've seen. And it was um, from The Independent with the, the headline, police called to school as pupils riot during toy and, and that was six days ago now um, and and it was uh, the kind of first few lines there are students at schools across England rallied against strict new rules stopped them from using toilets during lesson time on Friday uh, secondary schools in Cornwall Essex Lincolnshire were all reported to have seen angry mobs uh, angry pupils rioting against measures by shaking fences flipping desks kicking doors or standing on playing fields refusing to go into class um, mm-hmm. now that's the kind of inspiration for this conversation I'm sure the reason why other people have Mm. reached out to you to kind of ask your opinions on this but what was what was your first reaction or or your feelings when you you Mm -hmm. heard about these riots strikes protests Mm -hmm. I think I here we go again well is is one response and the the arguments aren't new we're not dealing with anything new here. And also, I'm very aware, I mean, I'm an English teacher by trade. So that's the kind of article I would pick out for my year nine class, for example. And I'd start looking at that language. And I'd start thinking, who is writing that? And what do they want us to think? Because they're saying there's an angry mob, right? Mm. The the image that you and I have in our brains right now are going to be different because we're different people. Now, um, a couple of young people throwing a desk to some people will feel absolutely validly like an angry mob. But when I say angry mob to you, you might be thinking of 200 people. So I think we've got to be very, very careful about what actually has happened. And I think that the the difficulty, and I suppose there's another feeling reaction that I had was, oh no, here we go again, because not necessarily because of the kids or the riots, the protest, but because of the backlash from it. And um, then the fact that it it creates often very um, binary arguments that that seem to want to force people to be on one side or the other. (laughs) And I just don't think that's necessarily that helpful to supporting this kind of behavior moving forwards. And I'll get an example I'll give you is that a a couple of the um, people who've asked me to do interviews this week, I won't say who they were, but uh, very big broadcasting places, let's put it that way. they wanted they wanted to pigeonhole me and go can you can you speak on this side of the argument as if it's this kind of set thing and i just think no because that doesn't help the children that's what i always come back to is how can we help the children the young people and me sitting on a binary fence is like that's not helpful so i think i probably get personally more annoyed about that kind of media backlashy negativity stuff more than i do the actual riots and that you know that angry mob we don't actually know what that was um from that scripture. No, and you know, and I think you know, I personally, when I saw it, I, I have been through this wave, and I think you're right to sort of mm. say that you know this binary kind of reaction. Some people do have strong feelings on this, and I should yeah. say to anyone listening, if you want to join this conversation, and this one really is a discussion because mm. I, I'm not 100 percent sure where where I stand on it or what uh, solutions I um, really think there are to this or, or how we mm. can move forward. Um, but um, why? you know why are we seeing this now uh, particularly maybe you, you know from from a newspaper point of view but also from the young people's point of yes. view is there a link you know i'm out on yes. strike today young yeah. people are striking this week about a different issue but you know is there something in that or is it mm-hmm. the post covid world is is this something different mm. um just to take it back a little bit to the point you said before i just want to thank you nathan for being so honest just there and just saying actually you're not completely sure how you you think about it or or what our responses should be um and i think that's really important to acknowledge because as we're starting to unpick it and say where's this behavior coming from and what can we do to prevent it or to support it or whatever it is um i think admitting that there isn't a hard and fast answer here is actually really useful because I think especially I'm talking particularly to the leaders in schools right now I think what I'm what I'm experiencing a lot is that those head teachers those um 
those SLT um, roles, they're being turned to a lot at the moment to go, you, you, need to, you need to have an answer for this. You need to have an answer for this. And I think what happens when we shove people into that space, people then react. Um, and this is going to come back onto the second part of your question. Um, they react from a place of fear of, well, oh dear, um, I, I probably should have the answer because I'm the head teacher or whatever it is. And so let's just put in this arbitrary rule. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And that doesn't necessarily unpick and find the sustainable solutions going forwards. So back to now the, the other part of your question, where's this come from? I'd be really interested to know from your point of view as well, Nathan, but the schools that I'm currently supporting, there is more anxiety, staff absence and stress in the schools than I've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, I'm not the longest serving educator that I work with. I know there are people who are, are older than me. I've been doing this even longer. Um, but I am feeling, um, as I walk into a lot of schools at the moment, um, I'm feeling dysregulation in general. Um, and I know that since lockdown, just from a very personal level, I have to do so much more now to keep myself regulated. Um, my capacity for um, heightened emotional situations, I have noticed, has got slightly smaller. And so when I'm with those kids who are throwing the desks, who are effing and jeffing, or, you know, all the things that happen, mm -hmm. my own then re-regulation and self-care, I've had to at least double it, if not more sometimes. And so then the question, well, why are we getting riots? Well, it's kind of obvious when you look at it that way. We've got a huge staff absence. We've got um, a huge amount of staff who are feeling very anxious and not just because of lockdowns, because let's not forget, we currently have a situation in Britain where people who are working full time can't afford to put their heating on or feed their children. That's stressful. That is really stressful and it feels very unjust. I know teaching assistants who are working full time and are having to use food banks. Hmm. Now, I feel there's something very wrong about the organization of our country if that's what we've got to, but we cannot pretend that that's not affecting our children. If they are going home and they are seeing very stressed adults around them, if they are cold, if they are not fed, then from a very purely biological reason, like the society and everything else we'll put on top, but just from a biological um, point of view, the systems are not regulated. We cannot be calm if we are not warm and fed and in a, a kind of peaceful environment. And it was interesting, I was speaking to a head of maths recently who was um, really struggling with this conundrum of why his young people weren't um, doing the, the revision stuff um, online. And one of my questions was, well, looking at the demographic of your school, is it possible that, that some of those adults, the parents, the carers are having to make the decision, we put the heating on or we put the computer on? Mm -hmm. And so then you've got a kid who can't do their revision. They come back to school, they feel shameful because of that. They feel annoyed, they feel frustrated. Maybe they see their other friends who are richer who can. And then we start getting the, the anger, the frustration, and then it needs to go somewhere and then it builds up and we get to protests and riots. Yeah, you know, I I do feel that, you know, I feel certainly, you know, and I, I, I put out on Twitter as one of the questions, you know, this kind of idea of attunement of the, you know, you can, you you have a feeling. And I would say this, that certainly I believe, whether, whether it's true or not, I believe that I have a feeling. And I've always kind of described this kind of attunement in a kind of very surfy, Matthew McConaughey kind of, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, there's a vibe, man. I can, I can, there's a bit of a vibe here, man. I Excellent. can feel it. Um, but it's, it's, someone online did suggest that they, they, they refer to it as the sassening which I quite liked, Ooh. an increase of sassiness all yep. round yep. Uh, and sharpness, a sharpening yes. maybe, but I do like the sassening um, <laughs> that you can kind of feel. And I recognise that. And also mm. I think, you know, particularly later on in the show, maybe when we talk about some practical approaches, maybe in tough yes. situations that people can can talk about de-escalation, I think that there is an issue. When I look at this, I, I think the protests, I almost separate in my head from the 
poor behavior resulting from the protests if that makes sense like the the, the protest mm. is one thing and i don't really mm. want to get into necessarily the rights and wrongs of locking toilets or maybe you know mm. there is a stricken strictening if that's a word of rules in schools and maybe that comes from a place of fear as well but certainly our reaction then to each other in stressful situations I think certainly I can see I would see that part of what could be a kind of relaxed oh okay they're going to do this you know let's let's let it run out let's see where it goes let's let's talk it through to no this can't happen no I must control this and I can see how that can cause friction on both sides and this kind of uh uh, stress level that you're talking about. Absolutely. You know, on what you've said, I was thinking about this earlier, about the the toilet issue, which is one mm. of those arguments that is not new. Mm. And I was thinking, why, why would the children or the young people protest if they are allowed to go to get past to go to the toilet? And I was like thinking this through. And I was thinking, because they're not protesting about that. They, I mean, I have had an increasing number of schools coming to me saying, can you please help us with children running out of class? They've seen a huge rise in the raise rise in the number of young people who are, are just leaving the classroom. And so what the real issue there is for the school is not necessarily that somebody is going to the toilet and changing their menstrual products or whatever they need to do. That's not the issue. The issue is that we've got kids out of class who are distracted, who then club with other kids, and then we lose the lessons. That's the real issue. And so then when it's, but, but I think sometimes exactly what you're saying, Nathan, rather than trying to slow it down a little bit and going, hang on, we've got an issue here because children aren't coming into class or staying in class let's deal with the root of what that's about what we do is go let's slap a rule on and it let's call it the toilet rule and then of course the kids are gonna um kick up kick off about that because that's not really what it's about and so that's that situation i was talking about before and i'm seeing this unfortunately a lot and i'm i am working my socks off to try and uh, help this it's a lot of big schools i'm seeing a huge divide between um, SLT and teaching staff and it is that thing of teachers turning teachers saying well the SLT need to do more discipline whatever that mm -hmm. may or may not mean it means something completely different to each of us and SLT saying well teachers aren't aren't um, being consistent anymore they're not dealing with small level issues so everything's escalating and I'm, I mean I'm seeing this pattern everywhere uh, if you're listening right now and it's you please know it's not just you and it's not just your school um, and there are ways that we can help this. But I think that, I think you're absolutely right that this kind of, um, this kind of, it, it just feels all very reactionary, doesn't it? And it is because there's a heightened sense of, I don't know what you call it. You, I mean, like you say, the, what was it? Assassinus? What would you Assassining, call it? The assassining. Assassinate. I think like, yes. are, you, are you aware of The Highlander, the film franchise, The Highlander? Have you Sorry, ever seen no. that? <laughs> right, okay. Well, there's a thing in this called the quickening, and it's where they 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 get their powers and they feel they feel kind of connected with the world. And so I mm. think it, it's it's a play on that where you, oh, you feel see. a connection with the sassiness and the mm. sassiness sassiness is rising, mm -hmm. the sassening. And I, I I did quite like that. Now I wanted to pick up on something you said there about this. You know, earlier on about this maybe not being a new thing, and and only in the context of what we're talking about here, and you know, children not agreeing with rules because mm -hmm. it was shared with uh, uh, us on online by um, uh, Suzanne um, Zedek, um, who, who shared a kind of thread of other previous um, strikes, yes. as they called them. Um, and, you know, so there was one in 1972, a big reported one about saying no to the cane. And, and I look back on that now. And as I look on it, I think, yeah, you know, I, of course, yeah, protest against the cane. There were people, apparently, uh, according to this article, which was from the um, Tribune magazine, um, the retribution was meted out on the backsides of the strikers. So they were caned for protesting wow. against the cane. And in my Gosh. head now, you know, with the, the social conventions, maybe, or the norms, mm -hmm. I look back at that and go, oh, oh my word. Now, yeah. the other one that's, that's that kind of ties in for me, and there have been other ones that, that we'll kind of get onto maybe a little bit, but was this one, 1911 in Wales, Mm -hmm. Okay, in and I only know this because I've actually taught at the school, Begin School, oh. up in Snethley, 
there, there was a um, a riot, a protest, a walkout, whatever you want to call it, you know, and reported on in different ways, even in the media at the time, where the students all walked out. Mm-hmm. It was at the time of the Llanetli, um railway strikes, mm-hmm. which I, you know, and I'm not trying to put the two together, but surely, you know, at a time mm-hmm. when teachers are walking out on strike multiple times mm-hmm. in this term, Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the students are seeing this behaviour, maybe hearing about it in the media. Yeah. And the same thing there, that, you know, these children walked out at the same time that their parents were striking about working on the railways. Yeah. And I don't know, is, is it possible that this is in the public conscious at the moment? Mm. I, I mean, who knows? <laughs> who <I'm> knows? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there are probably social... Um, what's it called? People who study society. Sociologists. So- sociologists, thank you. Sociologists. There are probably sociologists who are analysing that right now. I don't think I'm the expert on that, but it, it, it seems it seems kind of likely, doesn't it? And I yeah. think it's also... I think it's, it's, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Because mm. I feel... I have to say that the the way that this country is currently being governed is becoming increasingly, um, to use a school term, strict. Um, mm. I was protesting for the right to protest because yeah. I be- that is a human right, and I believe it's dangerous when we're not allowed to protest. I feel I'm that deeply scares me um, for our society, and. And so with that um, kind of increased strictness, I'm sure there's a word that's not a school word, but we're all we're all schooly people here. Um, we we'll call um, it strictness. Uh, yes. Yeah, we're, we're all clear what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but with that, um, it develops fear and develops this feeling of lack of control. Mm, and yeah. so whilst it's happening, let's say to us as adults, as workers, as frontline workers, and we are responding revolting whichever rioting protesting whichever verb that you'd like to use on it then it it does make sense that the young people would see that as well um and i think are we when are we having the break because i think there's a there's another big topic i want to bring up around this but i I don't want to go well, off halfway. Well, no, I, I, you know, you are transitioning us perfectly because I know, like, I, I'm, I'm planning, and it is very, you know, we we are supported by some wonderful people here. But when we come back after this thing, I do want to ask you more about the right to protest. Is that mm. where you're heading? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There. Well, definitely. Well, I should, cool. you know, for our listeners, we are, you know, wonderfully supported by um, John. Uh, Cat Publishers um, here at Teachers Talk Radio. And here's just a little message from them. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Live from Swansea, this is The Twilight Show with Nathan Ginn on Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Uh, welcome to the Twilight Show. It is twilight as we speak. It's this it's kind of magic mm. time of the year when I get to do my show and it's actually twilight. We're here with Adele Bates, Behaviour and Educational Specialist. Um, Adele, welcome back. Thank you very much. I, I do that just to check that you're still here. It always panics me. Um, but um, we are talking about... Um, protests you know we're going to get on to maybe about de-escalating how we can how we can deal with uh on mass civil disobedience i don't know what the you know the i'm struggling for the words for it because i'm not sure mm. strike is the right word for me um particularly around what what that means and how that's done about protests i think it's better um we're talking about that and just uh before we heard from our sponsors you were talking a little bit about this right to protest and it Mm. really does interest me and i you know i googled into this um about how the dangerous nathan dangerous (laughs) 
how the, you know, I was thinking to my, you know, how do the police deal with it? What is the police? You know, I said mm-hmm. to myself, you know, there must be some training. And we'll talk about uh, things that teachers can do, because I, as you have mm-hmm. said earlier, I don't think there is anywhere near enough uh, behaviour training. And certainly for uh, maybe assistant heads, SLT, who are faced with this kind of behaviour, I have not heard of any specific training for dealing with this kind of en masse behaviour. Mm-hmm. Um, but the police are because you know it is a right to protest the police are expected to not impede people's ability to peacefully protest and this you know is from the prime minister rishi sunak uh, who said um, the right to protest is a fundamental principle of our democracy but it is not absolute a balance must be struck between the rights of individuals and the rights of hard-working majority to go about their day-to-day business that was uh, january 16th of this year um and we I am supposing on to that my own personal opinion that this is a, a, a move towards restricting protest, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, callers, uh, other listeners might text in and disagree with me on that. I would say that, that that's where I feel this is certainly mm-hmm. going. But what are your thoughts on students' rights to uh, protest in any way? And I should mm-hmm. say, you know, we've put out a Twitter poll and there was an article shared by longtime listener uh, Mark Cratchley about the 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 incident maybe a, a couple of years back where some boys were wearing skirts to school to protest um, uniform policy what do you think about sort of the ability and the rights of young people mm. to protest okay so just to you asked me lots of things all at once Nathan I'm like yeah, <laughs> so just to go back to um Rishi's comment yeah. the issue I have with it is he says a balance must be struck between the right of individuals and the rights of the hardworking majority. Mm. So what he's done with his language there is he has divided what he deems to be the individuals, so i.e. like the people who are protesting, and the hardworking majority. And I think what he... I don't think it's a coincidence, I don't, and he probably didn't write it himself, did he? But... Um, <laughs> What he's suggesting in that phrase is that people who strike are not the hardworking majority. Mm. He is suggesting that. And I have to say, personally, that absolutely infuriates me because the people who are striking are you and I, Mm. or or our listeners, or our nurses, or our uncles, our aunties, our friends, our family. And I think that this question around the right to protest currently happening in Britain, um, I think that the people currently running the government are pitching it as if there are these anarchists who are looking, you know, cruising for a bruising, mm. to quote Greece the musical. Um, but actually, those hardworking people are the people who are protesting. And I think that it's very divisive language that he is using in that statement. And um, so that's kind of one point. And then the other point about the right to protest, I since you asked me a a couple of days ago to come on the show, I've been thinking very deeply about this because there's a very personal angle to this that I want to share. I don't think that without protest, I would be on this show and you would be interviewing me right now. Mm -hmm. Because firstly, I'm a woman. Now, historically, for most of... British society, I've had far fewer rights because of my gender. I didn't have a right to vote. I didn't have a right to education. I didn't have a right to uh, work after I was married. I wouldn't have had a right to own a house, all these kind of things. So that would be the first thing. So I wouldn't have been able to have such the the high level of education that I've got, the privilege to have that education. And therefore, I couldn't be a, Brit- a behavioral education specialist. So that's the first one. And then secondly, I'm an out bisexual teacher and my partner happens to be the same sex as me. And when I was at school, it would have been illegal for me to be having this conversation in a, Mm. in a school setting. Now podcasts weren't around (laughs) in the eighties and nineties. So I'm not quite sure how section 28, which was the legislation that put this into schools worked exactly how it would work with podcasts. But this is, this is me thinking into it. And I thought, well, the only reason, that I can stand here now as a professional, as an experienced professional in my field 
and be a woman and be a woman who's bisexual with a female partner is because of all the amazing people who some of them risked their lives to protest for those rights that I now have the privilege of, of, of using. Mm. And so when I started to think about it, I just thought, oh my goodness, this right is so important and integral to the way our society runs. And I think your example of the cane is just a brilliant one because in Britain now, we think of like, gosh, the cane, gosh, that was really archaic and that was really barbaric. And the general consensus is that. And yet at the time, that protest seemed radical. And I think what we notice when we look at change, now there's a brilliant gentleman, Dr. James Mannion. Uh, he's a fantastic uh, teacher and researcher in education. He is looking at the moment, I know, about implementation of change and the pattern of how societies change. And it starts with usually, and this is the next topic that I want to bring up, is um, those who do not have the privilege, those who are discriminated against, those who, it starts with where the issue is, if that makes sense. Mm. And they have to, first of all, as Minan used to say, you have to rock the boat. You absolutely have to rock the boat because the norm is in place. So if you say anything different from the norm, you're going to be seen as radical. You're going to be seen as inappropriate. You're going to be seen as all of those things. Now, I think of people like Nelson Mandela and what he did. It's like at the time, what he was doing seemed radical. He was imprisoned for what he was doing. And yet some of the things he was fighting for then start, not all of them, I, I realize, some of them, you know, filter into the way a community and in our case, a school is run, and then it just becomes the norm again. But you have to have those people in the first place who dare. And some of them, as I said, have, some of the people who've fought for LGBTQ plus rights have lost their lives through doing it. Um, and and so I do not stand here, sit here, <laughs> lightly talking on your podcast. I feel the gravitas of who's gone before me through protest in order for those changes to start to happen. So coming back to the, the pupils and their right to protest, um, I think as we look back in history, and, and yes, at the student protest, but also in general about protests, it seems to be a human thing that we do in our societies. And there's a reason for this, as far as I can see, and it's to do with privilege and it's to do with power. And this is something I want to bring it back to some of the kids that I work with. So this would be, um, I work with a lot of children in care, mm -hmm. children who have had to be taken away from their biological parents. And that's not done lightly in this country. It is usually because there is some severe abuse or neglect um, and trauma, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in my book, I, I do this in detail, but I'm going to briefly do it now. What I do is I look at the privilege that I have, not through any merit of myself, not because I worked hard, not because of any of those kind of things, but just because of who I am and who, where I happen to be born at the time and place. So I happen to have been born into a family where, um, there was somebody who could teach me to read. My mum did that. Thank you, mum. Right. I learned to read really early. Um, and I had lots of books available to me and I had a quiet place to learn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now my equivalent peer who was perhaps going through traumatic experiences or was in care or children's homes or having all that kind of disruption, things like reading are the things that kind of slip down the way. And we'll notice, you start to notice that when you're working with teenagers who've been through the care system, that sometimes their reading ages are very low um because of that because they literally just haven't had the support and the infrastructure to do it then we get up to let's say 17 18 so at this point i get the privilege of being able to go to further education i went to drama school first um and i can do that because i have a secure base that i can go back to with my parents they helped me a little bit financially as best they could and i had decent a levels that meant that i could access that at the same time my peer who is a child in care um they are suddenly given a flat by the state which is you know arguably a good thing but suddenly they're having to deal with things like bills and running a household and they haven't got any kind of financial or emotional support 
And so who is it who is more likely to go through higher education, to become a teacher, to become a leader, to become a head teacher, to, to start working in policy? The people who are going to be in charge of our societies and our schools are going to be the people who are more privileged going along. Now, there is nothing wrong with privilege. <laughs> we have it. But if we're not aware of it, what we start to do is we start to form our schools and our communities and our societies and our countries and our world in the picture that we know. So if I didn't know anything about kids in care or the way that they might behave or attachment issues or trauma-informed practice, if I didn't know anything about that, I could just go, well, why isn't everybody reading at the same note as me? They should be. And if they don't, I'm going to punish them. And there's nobody to question me because the only people who the only other people in power are the people like me because we're the ones who filtered through now you can you can use you can change that privilege and power to anything i've i've particularly used kids in care because that's a particular area and um, that i work with in inclusion but we can say the same about race we can say the same about disability there are all sorts of of minority groups that are not represented in power and therefore the only way they can get their voices heard they can't go through the ways, the, the kind of common ways, because it's not accessible to them. They don't have that privilege. And so they have to find other ways. And that's where protest comes in. And that's why you hear horrible kind of stereotypes about the angry lesbian, or even worse, the angry black lesbian. And it will be because those people um, are not able to and of course, I have to say there are absolutely exceptions, and this is a, a pattern that I'm talking about, but it's that actually to get our voices heard, if we are in a minority, we have to we have to bang the drum, and that banging the drum is the protest. So then when we think about our kids in schools, it, I think, okay, so of course, the adults are the ones who are running the school for the vast majority. I've worked in some schools as well that are self-directed learning spaces. And I must say they have far fewer issues with things like protest and far fewer issues with behavior um, because the kids are invited to create the school and create the curriculum and create the way of working in a day together. So they have this agency. So when they feel like I need to change this, it's not right, it's not working for my class or it's not working for my peers or whatever it is, they've got somewhere they can channel it. If we take away the way that they can channel it, then what else are they gonna do? They're gonna bang that drum. Now, I, you know, one of the things that interests me, you know, about that and about some of these is on an individual level, or, or, you know, all of this makes sense. And, and when I look at some of these things, you know, I, I you know, I, I am lucky enough to work in situations where I, 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 you know, work with some wonderful young people. But I have probably seen 190 of this pro um, pro, uh, protest over the 190 days. OK, just from mm -hmm. separate individuals. What interests me about the, these ones in particular is that everyone is doing it at the same time. Mm. And that to me seems that there's something different going on there because, mm. you know, I see children, you know, uh, walk out of class. You know, I see children yeah. be rude to members of staff because they don't agree or they feel there is it is their only power in the situation mm. is their only action that's available to them or at least that's what they feel or that they have the skills to do mm -hmm. you know they maybe don't have the skills to write a formal letter to the head teacher but that's their power and, and they're exerting yeah. it but they tend to do it one at a time you know mm. on separate days in separate lessons mm -hmm. what really interests me about these is that it's happened all at the same time it's a collective action yes. um which, which feels like it's a watershed moment Mm. I think um, one of the people who was um, interviewing me the other day talked about the, we, you know, we kind of ignore the fact that digital social media is huge in this. Um, yeah. When I did my petitions at school, <laughs> yeah. it was me and my friends and anyone that I could go and persuade. Um, and I think that and this is, I have to put my hands up here and go that I'm not an expert in this area, but the capacity now for you to spread your message very quickly um, has grown, hasn't it? So yeah. I think we've also got to keep that in mind. And I think that nothing new, again, nothing new's happened. It's just that the tools have changed. 
because yeah. when I think about um, how teenagers' brains develop, um, at this stage, they are, um, I'm just trying to work out how to do this without giving you a hole. I'm going to say a rude word. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I wasn't going to say a sassy. Rude word. They're sassy. That was my word earlier. They're a little bit sassy teenagers. No, I was trying no. not to give you an entire lecture on your um, the brain development of teenagers. Um, you can read about that in my book. But um, at this stage, they are looking to cut off the ties with their primary caregivers. Yeah. So usually their parents or carers, whoever it is. And so they are specifically looking for who are who are my community now? Who are the people around me? Who can I turn to, to identify with? And this is a really integral part of the development. This is really healthy because it's not just humans who do this, all mammals do this, because if we don't do this, if we don't have this stage of the development, then we become codependent on those primary caregivers. And as adults, we need to be able to be independent from our primary caregivers. So it's really integral that we do that. But I think that and, and of course, that gives us the pattern, unfortunately, of so many vulnerable young people slipping into gangs, yeah. because if they are looking around for role models and new identities and, and people to connect with, unfortunately, there are people who will prey on that and we get the grooming and the gang culture. So when I look at why has this all happened now, I've... As I said, this isn't my expertise area, but my personal opinion is it, it it's always happening. Um, students, teenagers, young people are always looking for who who can back me up on this, who can I connect with, who can I work um work with's the wrong word, isn't it? Work yeah. meaning a school word, but you know, who can I get together with um to to um identify with on this issue? But now what they can do is do it in their school and then share it with their school down the road and across the country well yeah you know it's interesting to me that you know we, we in the article that we talked about at the staff in the independent they say secondaries in cornwall essex lincolnshire and yorkshire this mm -hmm. isn't you know a, a, a localized issue where it's spread word of mouth or in the local newspaper or from neighbor to neighbor that you know that that digital element i guess and and, and saying oh these people don't like the toilet situation they've got i don't mm. like the toilet situation i've got we're yeah. the same, you yeah. know, and bringing it yeah. along. Now, I wanted to just swing back to something, you know, when you were talking about these issues and you, and you brought up the, the talk of the protests against the cane, a, a question that was raised to me, and I, I'm going to give you the feedback um, from a poll that we put out about what level of protest do you feel is acceptable in school? Mm. Um, but one of the um, questions that came back to me that really got me thinking was they said, um, about what? And and I said, oh, you know, what, what, what do you mean about what, about, about anything, what level? And they said, well, no, it's really important because different things. And I thought to myself at that point, mm. well, hang on, do I agree with that or don't I agree with that? Because at the moment, at the time of the caning and the protests about children being caned by ch children uh, protesting that, at the time, people believed and the school teachers believed that was right. Yeah. So I'm not sure that I agree that there is things that I would say, oh, no, what, you can't protest about that because mm. that's not important. Mm. I don't know if I want to put that cap on it. Yes. I think I talk often um, about behaviour being about context mm. because I, I, a really simple example I'll give is that if you bounce, come and bounce your ball repeatedly in my English lesson, I would I would deem that inappropriate behavior in the lesson, you know, very low level, yeah. but a quick example. Whereas if you do that in your basketball lesson, that's probably a really good thing. Um, if you do it in your exam, probably you're going to fail. And, and yet the behavior is exactly the same. And I think this is where we get around context. I remember um, on Twitter once the person who the government, um, has appointed to be in charge of behavior, they were saying, um, can we can we not just have rules um, that are completely set? And um, can they just be universal rules? And I, I suggested that that wouldn't work because each country has a completely different context. Each town has a completely different context each school has a completely different context so i think what you're bringing up is is spot on nathan is like 
actually on what are we saying is appropriate or inappropriate? And again, it comes down to um, what we're used to, what our experience is, what, um, and this is where we can get ourselves in all sorts of knots because we have statistics that say that, for example, our Gypsy Roma Traveller young people and our Black Caribbean boys are more likely to be excluded. Hmm. That has become a fact. Now that bias that kind of cultural bias thing, it starts in the classroom and it starts with us. It starts with us going, mm, their behavior is not appropriate to me, to me. And if I am not used to their culture, or if I'm not used to the way that um, different young people are, I'm going to deem that inappropriate, but it's only inappropriate to me and my little world. But if I happen to be um the person in the position of power and if it happens to be that all the other people in power look and sound like me too then that's why we get those kind of statistics those racist statistics that we do have in our british education system so i think you're absolutely right nathan it's it's about us looking at hang on a minute <laughs> that it's gonna be it is gonna be different like you say for different situations times places i I regularly have to think to myself you know when we're going through these things and i know that when i retire or when talking to my grandkids about you know my great grandkids hopefully about um what i did as a teacher there are probably going to be some things that i'm really ashamed of yes because yeah i'm pretty sure that those teachers who were caning thought they were doing the right thing yep as, as horrific as we look at it now, and mm-hmm. I'm sure there will be some things about what I do, whether it be, you know, it could be anything, it could be uniform, it could be, mm-hmm. you know, how we set children in classes, it could be, you know, even the way we structure learning, any one of those things, it could turn out down the line that actually that is a, a, a terrible thing to be doing. And our grandkids mm-hmm. will look at us and go, why did you ever do that? <laughs> you know, and so in my head, I'm kind of going, well, maybe we don't, right? Now, I want to talk about this kind of idea about what's acceptable level in pro of protest in schools because mm-hmm. I want to ask you you know you've talked about sort of the brain development of teenagers maybe them being different I know I've said that they're sassy um mm-hmm. the um and in and how they want to find belonging I want to talk a little bit just about whether they are able to do these things because certainly the context I work in I don't think some of these the young people would be able to do anyway but we asked mm-hmm. what level of protest would you feel is acceptable in school mm. the first option was to write a formal letter or have a meeting okay so you are upset about something toilets uniform whatever it is mm-hmm. 43% 43.8% of people who responded said that that was the appropriate level of protest that was allowed in school mm-hmm. okay um wearing an item of uh, or a color you know so maybe a pin badge, maybe a bracelet, that kind of raising awareness type thing. About 14% said for that. Breaking a rule or breaking uniform, it was about mm-hmm. 8%. And, you know, maybe I've mixed these up. I did try and rank them. But <laughs> at, the, at the other end of the scale was to walk out, strike, protest. And it was 339 said that. So mm-hmm. there is a significant amount of educators who think that the only thing young people should be able to do is to write a formal letter, say to mm-hmm. the head teacher or the governor, say, I'm very disappointed in the decision to lock toilets or to ask for a meeting. Mm-hmm. I would say that's an unreasonable expectation of teenagers of the forethought planning training even Mm -hmm. to to do those things Mm -hmm. what would your thoughts on that be i would tend to agree with you i would say that those are the things that we need to be teaching them and we're teaching them that for a reason because a lot of them will need help with that and so to expect them to suddenly be able to formulate. I mean, I've just written down literacy levels before we even start anything else. Mm. (laughs) Um, If that's the only way you expect your young people to communicate with you, then you are already cutting off X percent of your cohort who have lower literacy levels. Um, So that's the first thing. Um, Sitting in meetings can be terrifying. I mean, hands up, Nathan. I come in and work with schools and support local authorities, I find meetings very scary. And I'm an articulate, educated adult who's been brought in and hired to do that job. 
as a teenager going in to sit in front of um your teachers who you know you can tell and this is this is why that's challenging is because the the pupils will know unless it's a, a different formulated school like self-directed learning or something but in general they know that the power status in that room goes towards the the adults an adult can punish the young person the young person can't necessarily punish the um adult in a formal way so it's all well and good saying this is one way to communicate with us if there's an issue but are they really going to it's only going to be the odd one and i've you know we've got them i'm thinking of some of my kids the ones who will stand there and go actually miss <laughs> this is not right but that's not going to be the vast majority because the vast majority will be nervous to do that even more so if your school is one in which um tolerance and um compliance is kept as a high value because if you are working in a school where compliance is very important maybe that's through um all corridors have to be silent or um you know at lunchtime we only have to talk in this way this certain way if that's the kind of um, environment you have um you know that's one way of doing things and the consequence of that is that you are teaching literally you are teaching that compliance is very important and you mustn't put your head above the parapet and so mm. then asking a young person to put their head above, above the parapet in this formal way it's it is only going to be the um the sassy ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> the no, sassy another... and articulate ones i think as well no, and another point was raised about sort of the ability to do it safely and and, and parallels mm. were draw, drawn because you know with strikes and talking about the fact that you know there are we we have to have stewards at, at strikes we have to have permission and and yeah. you know to use the spaces all of these things there has to be advanced warning for a, a group gathering somewhere all of these things exist as rules mm -hmm. and as you say young people might not know them but uh, do we think or you know and, and this will be something because we're shortly going to pop to the news for us to talk about afterwards is dealing safely with these situations because mm -hmm. if we've heard in the news report yeah. and the truth behind it we don't know and what that was like on the ground we don't know for sure but mm -hmm. it went from a protest of we're all going to walk out or we're all unhappy to there being some um behavior that wouldn't be acceptable in an adult protest yes yes now i think yeah i think are young um, people able to to do a protest mm. and i think that's where we support them so i was really lucky enough to do some teacher training with amnesty international and what we did is i learned how to support young people to get their voices heard in quote unquote acceptable ways <laughs> and uh, we've obviously just debated that that's that's a, a, a difficult term to pin down but I want to give you an example. I had some young people who came to me and they were really upset that we weren't recycling in our school. It was a huge school, mainstream. And they said, you know, we want to go and, <laughs> what was it they wanted to do? Go and sit in the head teacher's office or something. Um, some brilliantly extreme protest kind of thing. And I said, okay, you could do that. What do you think the effect of that will be? And they said, well, we'll probably annoy the head teacher. I said, yeah, probably you will. Um, and I said, how does that get your point across? How does that show that it's more than you and your mate who think that the recycling is important? And so what I did over a series of weeks is I actually supported them to make their protest. And the first thing we did was I helped them research. I said, okay, so why don't you find out how many, whatever it was, boxes there are in each classroom that are supposed to be being recycled paper and they're not being recycled. Get your stats in, get your evidence in. I said, then, you know, next stage could be who else cares about this? The next stage could be what are the solutions so that when you bring up your topic that you want to talk about, you're not just saying this is bad, but also these are the really easy things and steps that could be done. So I supported my young people to go through that process. So I prevented them going to sit in the <laughs> teacher's office um, because that wasn't needed because I was able to teach them how to channel it. And I think this is where it gets really exciting and I get really geeky because they're so at this particular time in brain development particularly with young people and teenagers they are they are literally wired neurologically to be testing boundaries and um testing how the norm is and, and questioning the status quo and that's where you get the stereotype of of rebel teenagers kind of it kind of comes from because their brains are literally wired to do that 
And so, oh my goodness, what an incredible resource for schools and our country and our planet. There are huge issues in our world and our society right now. And we need people who are able to look at things differently, who are able to find different solutions, who are able to question authority, because some of the authority is not working. There are children in this country who don't have enough food. And so that what that tells me is the way that it's running is not as successful as it could be. And yet, and, and so we have this huge mass of, of young people who have this literally neurological wiring to question that and to think of new solutions and um, find new ways to do things. And I just think as schools, and I, I have been lucky enough to work with some schools who do do this, if we are able to support them and harness this energy and this that let's face it a lot of adults don't have this energy <laughs> to to do this then we could make incredible positive social impact definitely and i should say you know on on, on your point there of your, your wonderful example of these um supported young people to kind of go through the levels of protesting something we don't know necessarily from the article that we read out that i read out earlier from the independent there if any of those levels had been what we're hearing mm. about is when it's hip yeah. riot point yeah. as they say we don't know if there had been school council meetings before that if they had mm -hmm. tried approaching the head teacher to ask them to sort of change the rules or anything we haven't been had that information shared with us all, all, all that we've seen is the kind of flashpoint at the end I know that uh, the school in Oxford, because that was the one I was interviewed on um, mm. earlier in the week, they, um, there was a change in the uniform. There was a change of uh, uniform rules. And the big point was that the young people had not been consulted. They were just told one day. And that's why it kicked off. And the school have actually come back and said, oh, actually, we're going to go back into consultation because the, the kids kicked off and all. I think they did a walkout. There wasn't any mm. kind of violence as, as far as I understand. Um, but of course, I've only had that from media as well. I wasn't there. Um, but um, the school have come back and gone, oh, actually, yeah, we, we, we need to do a bit more consultation around this. And I think that's, that's really good of the school because actually they've seen that they made a mistake. And mm. as adults, we're going to do that. We are absolutely all the time going to do that. We don't always know uh, which particular issues do affect our young people the most because we're not the young people anymore. <laughs> No, that, that is that is very true. Now, um, we're going to pop to the news. But when we come back, I think, you know, it'd be really important. It would be a, a remiss of us not to talk a little bit about like what it is like for a class teacher facing um, this kind of things, things that they could maybe do, maybe some advice yes. for them, because, you know, we've talked at a very systems level, you know, things that maybe head teachers can do. But I'm certainly sure that there will be, you know, and I think, you know, you've mentioned fear already um, that there will be people, uh, teachers who faced with this don't know what to do, haven't yeah. had any um training in it and maybe don't feel that they've got any power themselves. So we're going to pop to the news. But when we come back, we'll be talking about that. Okay. okay. Right, we'll see you all on the other side of the news. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The iNews website covers the issue of vaping in schools. Whilst vaping is thought to have helped many adults kick their unhealthy smoking habits, the rise in straight to vaping in young people and children rings alarm bells for many. The report focuses on concerns expressed by teachers about angsty pupils struggling with the wait for their next fix. Vapors making school toilets frightening places as they gather in groups, increases in internal truancy and worries it may lead to pupils experimenting with stronger substances. Some schools have made significant changes to toilets to include sophisticated sensors which set off an alarm when e-cigarettes are used 
whilst others have increased numbers of staff on duty in corridors to deter pupils from skipping lessons in order to vape. Many schools have also invited police and health specialists in to talk about vaping in a bid to educate pupils on the dangers. Many schools across the UK now ban vapes, treating them like other banned items such as drugs and knives. This is prompting suspensions and other high-level sanctions in a bid to remove them from schools. England's Chief Medical Officer, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, said last week that the number of children vaping was appalling and heavily criticised companies which produce them in flavours such as green gummy bear and watermelon bubblegum. The bright colours, shapes reminiscent of highlighter pens, and the low cost of around £5 making them attractive to youngsters with pocket money to spare, which Whitty described as utterly unacceptable. The proportion of 11 to 17 year olds who say they have tried vaping rose from 14% to 16% in 2022, according to a YouGov survey, with a percentage of children who regularly vape doubling in the same time period. The article also features references to Teachers Talk Radio's Tom Rogers tweet asking how much of a problem vaping was for schools, with many replies indicating it is a serious cause for concern. Full details of the article are available online. In related news, many media outlets have been reporting on so-called school protests, which seem to be focused on toilets and the right to use them as a key issue. According to multiple stories, pupils have been encouraged to protest about rules focused on restricting free access to toilets by posts on social media platforms such as TikTok. The majority of the schools affected make it clear that rules around access to toilets are made for safeguarding purposes, designed to protect all pupils and to minimise bullying, vaping and other antisocial behaviours. The Evening Standard reports that a quarter of UK student gamblers may be experiencing harm whilst half said betting had affected their university experience. The survey of over 2,000 students at UK universities was conducted in December. It found that 71% of the respondents had gambled in the last 12 months, with 24% exhibiting problem gambling behaviour. Of the students who said gambling had had an impact on their experiences at university, 13% said they'd had trouble paying for food, 10% had missed lectures, and 9% struggled to pay bills. A third of student gamblers said they spent between 11 to 20 pounds per week, with 13% admitting to a spend of between 50 and 100 pounds per week. Only 55% of those surveyed were aware that support for them was available through their universities. Full details of the report are due at the end of February. Finally, Aberdeen Live reports on a project led by the University of Aberdeen which has led to a successful trial of a new approach to teaching which is helping improve adult literacy in Rwanda. The project adapted the existing adult educational curriculum to better develop relevant knowledge and skills which can be applied in students' daily lives. These techniques included role play, group activities, case studies and problem solving. Previously, only 14% of those pursuing an adult learning course felt they had gained the skills they needed, with 66% still unable to read and 76% unable to write by the end of the course. The new method showed improvements in multiple areas, with adults retaining their knowledge and skills, which were linked to nutrition and hygiene, improved household income, animal husbandry and becoming community leaders. The project was funded by the Scottish Government. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Live from Swansea, this is The Twilight Show with Nathan Ginn on Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Twilight Show uh, with me, Nathan Ginn, on Teachers Talk Radio. We are talking about de-escalating and making the most of student protests. We're joined by Adele Bates, Behaviour and Educational Specialist. We've been talking about the reasons, the reasons, possible reasons behind some of these protests, how the young people might be reacting. Um, welcome back, Adele. 
hello welcome can you remind me next time um to learn what hello is in welsh so that i can <laughs> come okay. back at you. do you know what i don't because anyone actually um you know sort of welsh will, will always points out to me that boradar is good morning but it's the most commonly like recognized across the rest of the country that ah. it is i should be saying probably by this time noswaitha which is like good evening um, okay. But yes, yeah, so there, there, there are different ones. So yeah, you, I, I remind say, me next time. <laughs> I end the show say Borida um, because it's it's like the the most common one. Um, right now, what are we talking? I, uh, what were we I talking about? De-escalation, ask, big groups. De-escalation, de-escalation in big groups. Now I said, you know, this is probably one of the biggest fears of teachers losing control of a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, that that is probably like a a teacher's worst nightmare, massive fear levels there, not something that we're ever trained on. We're trained very much in an idea of kind of one to one behavioral response, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of like how you deal with one child at a time. Um, I did put this out on Twitter and luckily there was someone out there, Clive Hill on Twitter, who was trained in crowd control in the army and you know so asking him kind of okay how does that respond back to um, situations and and his response really was that there's nothing useful the actual Mm. you know the army training in this situation would be transferable to a school his sort of points were you know control where they move to maybe contain them till they run out of steam um in a, in a safe and open area, that is, not, not containing them. He said de-escalation might include singling out re- ringleaders, speaking to them calmly, um, but they'd mm-hmm. need to be willing. Um, he also said, you know, staff are at risk of assault. If trying to intervene in certain ways, there would be mm-hmm. mobile phone footage potentially that, that could cause an issue. And, and essentially sort of said that there isn't a lot beyond hearing the student voice. Mm-hmm. Is there, you know, from your point of view, if you are faced with a class that is wanting to do something that you don't want them to do, and I think that's where I'm pitching this Mm -hmm. at the walkout, not at just general disruption, you know, they are getting up and they are going to walk out, Mm -hmm. or they are in the process of doing that. What would you advise a teacher to sort of be doing in that situation? Mm -hmm. I think what was it was the gentleman called Cliff did you say or Clive Clive, Clive. Clive. Yeah. Um, I I agree with a lot of what Clive said because at the point that they are that heightened that they, they are becoming um, uh, well, it's a phrase I don't really like to use but I can't think of the alternative now it's getting late um, <laughs> but when we're not on mass they've become um, the behavior is is not controllable by a teacher um, that is not the point at which you start trying to remind them of the rules, trying to punish them, trying to talk to them, trying to reason. It's not the it's not the time to. And again, there are neurological reasons for that and um, regulation reasons for it. If we are that heightened that we are are doing this kind of quite extreme behaviour, especially if we're then doing it on mass, we can't we can't take in that information, and you are just gonna add fuel to the fire. And I think what Clive says is absolutely right. The best thing to do, I mean, your number one is safety when it gets to that stage. And um, it is about how can we diffuse this situation? And it might be, let's say you've got five or six who seem like the ringleaders. And let's say you can't get to them, you can't, you, you can't reason with them, you can't do anything with them. But actually, there might be 20 other kids who are just kind of hanging about and enjoying the spectacle or enjoying the drama. So actually maybe it's those 20 kids that you approach first. I have been in this situation actually, and um, it was in my NQT year (laughs) and it was quite heightened. It was quite amazing. Um, So I was supporting, it's, it's, it's quite ironic. I was supporting some young people who were uh wanting to do i feel like i've mentioned amnesty a lot i suppose it does come with protest doesn't it um but i was running the amnesty international club and these young people had asked to um gain more uh, signatures for their petition and it was about some prisoners in ecuador who'd been put into prison um incorrectly as let's say so my kids were writing letters to the president of ecuador they were using their mfl skills they're writing in spanish to try and protest this and they wanted to send a petition and letters of support to the prisoners of conscience and what they decided to do was 
get you know the um the cage on wheels that some of the caretakers use <laughs> yes i know exactly what that yes. is yes yeah. okay you can see where this is going so they decided that what they wanted to do is sit in this cage in the library to sh to be to like get people interested you know why are you sitting in a cage well because we're representing the prisoners who are caged and you know to, mm. to basically start the conversation so i thought this was a great idea <laughs> um and it would have been if it weren't for wet play <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so the um in the library they had a clicker so they knew how many people were in there and it was supposed to be only so many people so many students at a time but because it was wet play and there were very few kids places kids could go indoors for some reason the rule goes out the window when it's wet play i don't know i don't know the logic of that so i was told afterwards at one point there were 200 pupils in the library and my kids from my club in a cage oh god yeah. <laughs> protesting so um and i have to say hands up i didn't clock the situation quick enough i was an nqt at the time mm. um but i was just very excited because what i saw was great look at all these other signatures we can get for the petition <laughs> yeah so i went to my kids and i was like great you know let's get everybody involved um and so what they said they said miss could we stand on the table so i went and got permission from the librarian to stand on the table yeah. so that they could make an announcement and just to say if you're wondering why my friends are sat in the cage it's because we're doing this petition da -da 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 -da, um to 200 kids at which point <laughs> um it just got a bit hysterical i mean workplace hysterical at the best of times but then there were their friends were in a cage, then they'd stood on a table and it just, the whole thing just got really frenzied. And it wasn't that these young people were particularly protesting for anything. I mean, apart from my ones who were doing the, the petition, but mm. you know, the, the general rest weren't. It's just that they were very heightened. There was a lot of energy. It was wet play. You know what it's like. Um, and so what started happening is that some of the other pupils started standing on the tables and shouting. Mm. And then some of the other ones came to the ones in the cage. And at that point, um, another member of staff just turned to me and just said, take your kids out right now. Otherwise, you'll never be able to do anything like this ever again. Yeah. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. Because at that point, there was no point me trying to go oh hang on no calm down everybody like it was past mm. the point and i have to say as an nqt with 200 people um young people it it was scary i was scared at that point and because it was the library it's that classic playtime thing isn't it there's mm. never enough staff because you're all covering each other's duty so it wasn't as even if as if we had a full staff so but but i think that member of staff was absolutely right we took them out immediately um the ones that we could the ones that were easier to take out if you see what i mean um so that then that was at least kind of 20 at least <laughs> at least 10 mm. percent that we'd got out so that then the others could be de-escalated and i think that is if you are sat in a situation in a classroom sometimes secondary school teachers it is only you you are the only mm. adult in the room so safety is number one and that includes your safety as well as the mm. kids safety um, I think that's important to say. Um, so it is about how can we diffuse this situation? We cannot reason with it when it's got to that stage. It's about diffusing it. And I, I love your idea about, um, I don't know if you've said this or whether uh, we were just talking about it before, but um, out, you know, get them out in the field. It's mm. not about containing them in a small space because that, that can be very, very um, provocative actually to put somebody in a small space. It's not very nice. Yeah. I think, yeah, you know, for me, I, you know, I've thought about this and, you know, kind of thought about like, what advice would I give? And I think the, the only things that I've ever seen, like one thing for me, for sure, is I, you know, I have never, I, for very small children, maybe, but even in, in primary, you know, they, they get big enough to hurt you fairly quickly. Yeah. I've never stood in a doorway that a child wants to get through. I have never done that. And I would advise people never to do that, you know, unless you have some very specific training and know exactly what you're doing. There, mm -hmm. is, there is no point, you know, unless there is imminent danger, which there probably mm -hmm. shouldn't be on a school grounds, mm -hmm. imminent danger, you know, don't stand in their way. I would probably let them go. I probably wouldn't, you know, I don't think 
I'm a fairly calm kind of guy anyway. And I mm -hmm. like, uh, I, you know, I don't shout. I don't see the point. You know, we can deal with it later. There's no point in being heated in the moment because I think mm -hmm. that, you know, it sounds like it would escalate more. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'd just kind of let them go, supervise them, go, okay, you know, you're all going, you're all protesting. That's fine. I'll just make sure you're safe. Yes. You know, absolutely. and I'd go with it. And I think, you know, the only thing that I really came across is if I was really faced in a whole scale kind of situation and you know I said this in conversation with Clive is the school has two policies that I think are people forget about for dealing with incidents and one of them is if you want everyone to be somewhere there's the fire alarm yes and most people will follow that and yeah. it will send them all outside and so if I was really faced with a whole school mm. problem I think I would probably, mm. you know, getting SLT to call the fire brigade first so they didn't turn up, get someone just to to, to, to set off a fire drill and mm. have everyone go out onto the playground and start lunch early, yeah. you know, or something, yeah, like that. something like that. I do like I the idea of talking to the finding, not ringleaders, I think maybe is not a word that I like about it, mm. but yeah, certainly point, talking to some, some key individuals, some... So some people other people look up to or maybe getting a focus group together and saying hey what's going on what's this yeah. about having that conversation I think is really important absolutely I mean I've been in situations where I haven't been able to de-escalate the situation um let's say between a group of four or five because mm. they're so they're seeing red let's say it's a fight they're seeing yeah. red at each other however there'll be some somebody within their peer group who I know could have, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying ever to suggest that you put a, another pupil in danger at all, but I'm able to talk to talk to perhaps not the person who's doing the, the most kind of um, conflicting uh, part of the situation, but perhaps somebody who knows them and go, oh, what's happened? Are they okay? You know, what can I, and sometimes that can help. And it's actually other kids that can calm other kids down more than I can, because don't forget that we are people in authority. We are mm. adults. So that's going to make them react as well. And I think you also brought up another point there that is absolutely integral to this. Yes, there may be what feels like the majority turning into a mob if we uh, if we take the uh, Independence article. Yeah. Um, there will be a huge number of young people very, very scared. Mm. And they'll be yeah. scared because the boundaries and the um, safety of the environment has shifted. They will be looking to you. And I think a good example of this for me is when I'm on an aeroplane, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the best flyer. I, I can do it, but I'm not, I'd much rather not be on a plane, right? Mm. So what I always do is when there's that turbulence, when there's that weird noise, my instinct is to panic because I don't know about planes. I don't know if I'm safe. I don't know how a plane, you know, all the things. Mm. So I will look to those air hosts and I and my dad taught me this. He said, if they're panicking, then it's time to panic. <laughs> yeah. There are going to be so many students looking to you that you won't even realize looking at you thinking, well, is the teacher panicking? Mm. Because if the teacher is panicking, then I know I'm not safe anymore. And then they are more likely to run away or cry or fight or, you know, fight, flight or freeze as well mm. as the as the the louder ones. So if at all possible, um, remain calm yourself i think what you said about not shouting absolutely absolutely because the minute the minute the adult starts going into ah, da, 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 then you as as the adults in the space we are then escalating the situation as well and that's the last thing anybody needs at that point if we are unable though for example there are particular circumstances that you might be in that are really triggering for you and you know you can't remain calm then that's the bit um you know, that's where we have to start working as a, or even before that, working as a team and leaning onto our colleagues to, to take over as soon as they can. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe in some of these situations, it might be you that they're protesting against, I mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. you know, and so then you're not the best person to de-escalate them in that situation, maybe. Mm -hmm. I do think one of the other things, you know, we, we haven't necessarily touched on, um, maybe is I, I'd say that a lot, this is, a, for me, a lot of this is about voice. And mm. they haven't been able to voice it in any other way. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I find, you know, actually it's going to eat up someone's time, maybe a deputy head or a head teacher's time. But if some of those children had an hour to complain to 
someone they felt was in charge, Mm -hmm. then you might have a chance at settling things back down without it it, it turning into the the independent articles riots, as they call it. Sorry, I I did speech marks then with my fingers and I I realised we were on the radio. But riots, (laughs) riots, yeah. I I think you're right. And I think that... um... I think it's like it's like the example I was talking about with with my kids and the recycling. One of the things that I do to support schools with this, I mean, I'm having a lot of schools saying to me at the moment, we need to improve our behavior. Can you help us do it? Which, of course, is this huge concept. So one of the things that I will always invite schools to do is to set up um, a consultation that I will lead, which is a mixture of all staff. So I'm talking a governor in that room, teachers from different subjects or year groups, um, teaching assistants, the caretaker, a dinner supervisor, like a real mixture. And I always request for around six at least of the young people, and now I hear my inverted commas, known for their behaviour across Mm. the school. Because if you are going to start changing behaviour policies, if you're going to start changing rules, if you do that without consultation, they're going to kick off in another way. They will they will want to get their voices heard. And this process, I've done this several times at several schools, this process of inviting those young people in who we all know <laughs> are the ones with the most behavior points across the school, to bring them in and say, we're looking at our behavior policy, our approaches, etc. And we think this might affect you. What do you think just at that stage, not to say we're going to rearrange the whole school about what you think, but we want to hear from you at this level is just incredible because then they have agency in it. They're getting their voices heard. And they usually, I have to say, nearly every school I work with gets nervous about doing this. And by the end, the overwhelming feedback is just, wow, they were really respectful, these kids. We were expecting them to kick off. Why would they kick off? They're being invited into the space to be heard. And then from there, I work with, th- that's the initial consultation. And then I'll I'll pull that through to what I call like a working party, which, so it's kind of, it's a kind of a mixture of school council, but at school council, you are going to get the type of pupils who, I mean, are essentially like I was, <laughs> like <laughs> the academic ones who are good at speaking, who are kind of get on well in the system. If that makes yep. sense, they get on well in the way that the system is made. You are not going to get your ki- your kids who are on the verge of exclusion in the mainstream are highly unlikely to be your school rep in school council. Mm-hmm. And yet, when you're talking about things like behaviour, what's appropriate, what's not, it's going to affect them more. So, how about you have a working party that involves them right from the start? And I I support schools to do this very successfully because it's coming back to that point we made earlier. The kids know stuff that we don't. <laughs> We yeah. just don't. <laughs> it's, you know, I, 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 I really think, and it sounds like, you know, from the example you gave of the school in Norfolk, that, that they have seen, they have learnt from this happening, that mm. actually that, that stage being there prevents sort of um, unintended uh, kind of upset and behaviour mm. further on. Um, now, you know, I could, I, we could have talked about this for hours because it's such, it is very mm-hmm. interesting to me. I'll be very interested to see sort of how it goes forward because I don't know for sure if it is, you know, a civil unrest in the country, if it is because mm-hmm. we are striking, if it's because of stricter rules. Certainly, mm-hmm. it's been really interesting to explore with you. So thank mm-hmm. you so much for coming on. And I just want to say as well, just thank you for actually having the discussion um, because I... I get very nervous when I'm asked to talk on these things. And I think what you've, what the platform that you've created this evening, which I'm really grateful for, is for us to go, it's not easy. There aren't any strict answers. However, if we can start to look at the reality of this, the fear that Mm. is in both the adults and the pupils and how we support that and how we look at this in a kind of sustainable, more um, contextual way, um, we could actually find ways forwards. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to actually get into those discussions rather than the <laughs> the uh, tabloid version. Let's put it that way. Certainly, yeah. Um, I, I did try. You know, I put the title of the show like I predict a riot. I was trying to. I, I'm very bad at being tabloidy. Is the reality of it? I'm, I can't do tabloid. Um, so, um, uh, if people wanted to reach out, find you, follow you, uh, how do they do that? 
So the best thing to do is find my website, which is adelbateseducation.co.uk. On there, I've got over 300 free resources now all around behaviour um, that you can go and delve into. That's both for leaders and at uh, classroom level and teaching assistants and staff um, support level as well. And if you want to work with me further, then do go over to my contact page and you can get in contact with me there. Let me know uh, what's going on in your school and what support that you are looking for. Oh, super. Right. Um, and I will do a little bit of Welsh now because we do say good night. We say nos da, which is nos night da. good. Yeah, night mm -hmm. good. So nos da, Adele. <laughs> nos da, Nathan. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we will see you all next time on Teachers Talk Radio. Good night. Ta-ra. Ta-ra. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.